Susan. We're very, very privileged to have Susan LaGroix, is that how I pronounce it, Susan, from the Center for Sustainable Shale Development. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, thank you. And you can see your bio on the handout, so I'm not going to waste time. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and try to talk in that microphone. Well, as you indicated, my name is Susan LeGrow. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Sustainable Shale Development. We are a not-for-profit organization that was founded in 2011. Um, we were founded to be a group, a, a group of companies involved in the drilling industry, as well as uh, environmental, uh, non-governmental organizations, and some philanthropies all of whom were interested in trying to find a way to get past the impasse of uh, can you all hear me? Only if you look right into it. Oh, okay. I'll send that this way and it's a little better I think that for you. Mm -hmm. All of whom were trying to find a way to get past the impasse of I'm right and you're wrong or it's got to be one way or um, it's all bad or it's all good. Thinking that there was some middle path that might allow us to take advantage of the, the economic resource that shale gas offered and yet at the same time do it in a way that did not leave issues for future generations to deal with and that would be sustainable. So I call out my presentation the social license to operate and what that is intended to say is that this is a group of companies who recognize uh, that if they are going to be in the area working with communities for a long period of time, that they have to be able to develop the level of trust and confidence within those communities in the way that they're going to be doing business. So these are companies that have voluntarily agreed to undergo uh, a third-party process of verification as to whether or not they're meeting some very rigorous performance standards, and to use that to brand themselves, if you will, as um, companies who are prepared to meet the highest standards of performance in the drilling industry. And you can see that I'm also very good at IT. <laughs> technological 
uh, capability at this time and, and are geared to addressing the risks that have been identified as associated with drilling. Um, and then also are continually being improved as our knowledge of drilling and the, the scientific issues and the health issues increase. So these should work. <laughs> as you're on, I put you on your second slide. Thank you. So this is what I was talking about. Um, what they decided to do was uh, they have a, a very defined um, scope of activity. It was going to be geared toward uh, drilling in the Appalachian Basin. Uh, it was a group, as I've indicated, of conceptually aligned entities, whether they were on the environmental side of the, the fence or the industry side. And it was actually a constrained group size, as you can tell from what I, I've already said. And again, that was thought to be important because the issues were so volatile uh, and so divisive. They wanted to start with a small group who were really committed to coming to some kind of agreement and committed to the process of consensus in order to see if they could move forward with this. Well, actually, they were quite successful. Over about a year and a half of very intensive discussions they traded scientific data and points of view on what was necessary, what are the risks, what, what measures can be taken to address those risks, what's real, what's not real. And they identified 15 performance standards. And I have a slide that I'll be showing you a bit later on that, that identifies some of the performance standards. And they are all available on our website at sustainableshale.org. Um, and the, the standards identify both air, groundwater and surface water issues uh, and air and climate issues. And the standards are intended, as I said, to represent the furthest reach of what we believe is possible for um, drilling companies to attain in terms of limiting emissions and safeguarding risk. The, the most important element of what we've done beyond articulating standards, because there are other groups that have articulated standards, is that we have set up a process for certification for companies who meet the standards. In other words, companies who believe that they are meeting the standards can apply to CSSD for an auditing and verification process under which they will be evaluated as to whether or not they're complying with the 15 standards. Uh, if in fact they do, they will be issued a certification that lasts for two years that they are meeting the standard. During that two year period, there will be follow up visits from uh, the, the certifying, the, the testing company to make sure that in fact the standards are continuing to be met. And we have contracted with a company named Bureau Veritas, which is a, 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 about a 200-year-old company that has operations all over the world, very much involved in the testing, auditing, and certification field. And with them, we have worked out a verification protocol, requirements for auditors to be trained and, uh, and experienced, to go on to use experienced auditors. Uh, and again, the verification protocol is also available on our website.
It represents people from industry, environment, and an online community, all of whom are people of great experience and achievement. I think that the fact that we have a group of people, we have a balanced board uh, in terms of representatives from the, the two points of view. Um, we also have an equal number of what we call non-aligned board members, people who are um, members of the community, members of the scientific community, um, who are very much committed to making sure that the process that we have identified for consensus building on, uh, on performance standards and then implementation of those standards and a, and a transparent certification process are being carried out. We have several committees, and as, as you may guess from what the explanation that I've given already, the committees are balanced in terms of representation of industry and uh, the environmental community. The standards committee meets regularly to review the existing standards and update them as necessary if, if we have great new information about what is possible, new information about what some of the risks and problems are, we update the standards. So that is an ongoing process. Uh, they evaluate the standards as they exist, identify where new standards are necessary, and recommend those standards to the board. The evaluation committee works uh, also to identify issues relating to the certification um, and, uh, and makes recommendations to the board in terms of the certification. I also want to tell you that the certification process, which was announced in January of this year, is up and running. The first company uh, has applied for certification. We expect the first audit to be done in the first two weeks of, ju of June. Uh, we have another company that is just about ready to apply. Each of our four companies who are currently members have announced that they intend to apply for certification sometime during 2014. The certification process is also open to anybody else in the drilling industry who would, who would like to be certified. They do not necessarily have to be a member of CSSD. And in fact, we're very hopeful that as we move through the certification process with our current members and companies see the benefits that can be gained by identifying yourself as a company that is willing to do better than regulatory standards, that, that they will sign up and start to participate in the certification process as well. Uh, we have a certification decision committee as, as the auditor makes its, um, its review and files its reports, we will uh, review that and we have a decision committee made up of our non-aligned members who will make the decision whether or not certification is to be granted. This is just a, a depiction of our, our, our structure. And the main point of that is to indicate to you that throughout the, the board of directors and the committees, we have a balanced representation of industry and environmental groups. That, that's also true in terms of our funding. Some of our funding does come from the gas companies, but we seek an additional balanced amount of funding from the philanthropic community. These are some of our performance standards. Again, as I indicated, uh, they're intended to be beyond compliance. Sorry, Bear with me one second. Okay. Each of our standards is intended to exceed uh, regulation, and as I indicated, as regulations are changed, we evolve our standards. Some of you may know that recently Ohio um, revised some of its standards with respect to groundwater, and we are in the process of revising our standards to keep up with that. Um, we're constantly watching what's happening in other states, Colorado, Wyoming, other states, to see where some of those states are going in terms of their standards to make sure that we are always more stringent than what regulation requires, or at the very least, if regulation represents the, the, the high watermark of what can be achieved at this point in time, to make sure that that is incorporated in what we're doing. 
It's not only what, as I indicated, these standards are intended to represent a, a departure from their mindset that if I'm in compliance with the regulations, I don't need to do anything more than that. With respect to air issues, uh, our requirements um, deal with the, the panoply of what's going on at a well site. Uh, we require reduced emissions completions, also called green completions. We have very strict limits on when flaring can take place. Uh, we require removal of hydrocarbons from flowback. And we have emission standards for every kind of engine that's used on a site, including any of the automotive engines. All engines that are gas fired are required to use ultra low sulfur fuel. Uh, and uh, there is a limitation on um, the, or a requirement that uh, the vehicles that are used have to meet, uh, by a certain period of time, 95% of them have to meet EPA uh, emission standards. Again, this is a, a summary of how our accreditation program works. Uh, again, we have auditor guidance, verification protocols. We've developed an entire auditor toolbox. We've run two weeks of auditor training with auditors from Texas, Louisiana, people who are familiar with uh, conventional gas, unconventional gas, offshore gas, people who are familiar with ISO 14000. Uh, a panoply of uh, skill sets for our auditing teams. <coughs> so essentially what we are trying to do, I think, is, is very clear. We're trying to set a standard for responsible uh, shale gas development. We recognize that what we're doing perhaps isn't for everyone, but we do hope that as we proceed and we show the benefits, again, of working with communities and obtaining the social license to operate, that more companies will want to join with us and support our efforts. So that, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, I, uh, forgive me, I was a mess. I should have introduced my fellow council uh, members before we started. Don't sit down yet, Susan, because no. uh, the way we're going to proceed today is the presenter will give their talk and then members of the council will ask some questions. So. I want to introduce William Robinson, Jan Ray, Tom Baker, and Barbara Denko, and I'm Sumi's business. <laughs> that was my campaign sign. So, um, I, 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 does anyone want to ask Susan? Go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead. Let me ask you maybe an embarrassing question, but I'm going to keep asking. How does this benefit black people? And where are the black people who are involved in what you're doing? I haven't seen one name that you've listed of a black person. I haven't heard you talk about how it's going to help black people. Do you realize the economic condition of black people in this region? If this is such a good idea, it should be good for black people. Where are the black people? How does this relate to black people? 85% of my constituents look like me. And I unashamedly speak on their behalf on this issue. Well, I can't. Uh, I can't tell you that the people on my board, that any one of them is black. Uh, but I can say that I think that what we're trying to do is to benefit everyone, no matter what color they are or what community they come from. I think overall the benefits for all of us from, from a process of consensus and a process of trying to improve the environment and to make sure that things are sustainable and yet at the same time that we reap the benefits of this, uh, of, of this resource are positive for all of us. And I would be happy to talk with you further if you have specific ideas about how we might be more diverse. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Means. I guess my only comment would be I was looking at some of the standards, the water standards, and things, the practices you're asking that you know anyone to do a credit to uh, its, um, a partner with you. Uh, and, and are those standards say, I, I just noticed one, that the, the lining that would be underneath, uh, your standard would be a double lining. 
Correct. So the normal standard is one liner with no detection, or is the standard a double liner with detection already? I guess that's my question. I'm just, I'm just looking at that one. Yeah, the standard for impoundments is a double liner, but we also have other standards that, standards that work in tandem. For instance, I think one of the standards that we have is that, that is most unique and not required necessarily by state law is that we require for each well pad, before it goes in, the operator has to identify what's called an area of review. And that is, they have to define a radius around that well pad of identifying particular environmental and community impacts that might result. Habitat, groundwater, previously existing wells, seismicity. What kind of impacts would we be having on this area of review? And surface streams. If there are particular factors in that area of review, in the area, they have to define it more broadly. In other words, they define the area of review related to what is going to be happening and what is going to be impacted. And in addition, they are required to do pre-installation groundwater monitoring so that they establish a baseline of what is there, what exists already. And then they are required also to do post-drilling groundwater monitoring and continue that monitoring for two years after the well is completed. So that, again, this will help us gather data about what was there, what impact that we had, and hopefully help inform our process of reviewing these performance standards as well as inform the process of the regulators in terms of what do we need to require. Okay. Thank you. I think that's it. My only question for you is what I've been asking everyone as I've been talking to them is if you were us, would you vote yes, no, or would you want it amended if you were us, one of the 15 council members? Everyone wants to know what we think. I just think it's interesting to listen to the question on others. You know, I leave that to you. I'm not going to... Okay. Thank you. I'm going to answer it for you. When the RRFP was sent out, it was in part of the RFP that whoever bid would comply with CSSD standards. And that was touted as a great part of the RFP. Well, the lease that we have, that the county executive has put forward, does not use the word CSSD anywhere in the lease. And since we're talking about range and Huntley and Huntley, I was wondering if you, your organization, has had any conversations or reached out to range and Huntley and Huntley to see if they want to become part of your organization or if they've already said no or, you know, if you want to share any of that information. Well, let me tell you that I am fairly new to CSSD. I started the first of February. So I can tell you, though, based on my understanding of what preceded me, that the organization has reached out and will continue to reach out to range and to many other operators to encourage them to join. We've had some good conversations with range. They are not currently members, but I don't know that the door is closed on that. In fact, I'm very hopeful it's not. Oh, I have a couple of questions. So you don't have to be in western Pennsylvania to join. You could be in any state to join. Is this sustainable? Well, our focus is on the Appalachian Basin. And part of the reason for that is because there are factors that are unique to the Appalachian Basin in terms of hydrogeology and geology, et cetera. And I think also from the outset we recognize that if you tried to do this on a national basis, you'd be in a debate for years and years. So we wanted to try to accomplish something in a short period of time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
short period of time, recognizing how quickly everything in the shale landscape shifts. Uh, so our focus is on the Appalachian Basin. Having said that, the approach can be applied in almost any area. Uh, certain of the standards could also be applied in almost any area. Some of the standards dealing with what kinds of fuels are used in the engines on sites. But again, then, some, some other standards may not be particularly applicable, depending on whether you're in an area where you can do deep well injection or whether you have a lot of seismicity or many old groundwork. So it, it really depends. Um, so our focus is on the Appalachian Basin, um, recognizing that it, the approach can be adopted other other places. We welcome other members. I, I wanted to confirm to you in your talk, you said Shell, Console Energy, EQT, and Chevron have all, they're your founding organizations and they all intend to join. And you have two more organizations, um, companies that in, are in the process. One already has no, begun. No, we have four companies who are the original four members. Okay. Each of them has committed to going through the certification process this calendar year. Okay. Um, one is already in the certification process, and their audit is going to be taking place the first two weeks of June. A second one is um, very close, <laughs> um, and then the others will uh, presumably be following that long afterward. So we are very hopeful that all four will have gone through the process uh, before the end of the year, and that we'll have four certified companies, but we won't know until that happens, you know, until the, the certification has gone forward. Um, Thank you, Susan. Does anybody have any questions? What are the concerns of Mike? And I'm going to ask this of anyone that comes here to speak, if the chair allows me to. Do you know any people that look like me to have expertise in this area that I can call and ask them about what you're saying or anyone else here tonight will say? And it may be someone, I don't know, at Talladega University, Florida A&M. Uh, they may be at any place, Howard University. Is there anybody in this United States of America that looks like me that I can call upon for some expert information on what you have presented and others are going to present it? Because I haven't seen any black folks that have come forward. I don't hear anybody even suggesting that this relates to black people other than what Mr. Fitzgerald has said, how it relates to black people. I wish he was here. Uh, if you know someone, could you please give me a name so I can call someone, male or female? opportunity to uh, address you as well as the members of the audience. Um, just several years ago I had the opportunity to do a similar sort of thing uh, with City Council when they were discussing whether or not to have a ban on drilling within the city confines. So what I'd like to do quickly, I am an environmental microbiologist by training. I am the director of the Center for Environmental Research and Education at Duquesne University. Um, what I, you know, if I say what I do during the day, uh, has been uh, a while ago uh, looking at very strange metabolisms involving uh, metals and arsenic and things like that. So one of my studies has been looking into arsenic and drinking water. So uh, several years ago, it's now going on four and a half years um, in teaching my class, I started delving into uh, the environmental impacts of unconventional shale gas drilling and through funding opportunities and whatnot, I've been across uh, much of uh, Pennsylvania, not so far east, but basically uh, mostly in southwest Pennsylvania, 
uh, places like Butler and Washington County, interviewing people, sampling their water, and uh, finding out you know, whether or not uh, shale gas drilling poses a threat to drinking water sources, considering that over 3 million people in the state, of, or there are over 3 million water wells in the state of Pennsylvania. So a lot of people deal, uh, are dependent upon the, uh, both subsurface and surface water for their drinking water, including us who live in Pittsburgh, and uh, I live in the North Hills, but nevertheless, we, deal, we get our drinking water from surface sources. Um, I'm going to share a few tidbits of information that are relevant to the discussion, as well as present some of my own data that, again, are relevant to the discussion of whether or not we should or should not drill in or around county parks. Uh, the first thing is, is just, you know, I, I want to say that if you don't frack, you don't get gas. This is one of the most, uh, I would say, especially with the landmen, this is something that's very confusing. In the old days, if you drilled a hole in the ground deep enough to hit a conventional deposit, you get gas. And if your neighbor was unfortunate enough not to drill before you did, you could get their gas, and that was fine. Here's a situation where if you don't frack, you don't get the gas. The other important thing to realize is that when you do frack, you've stimulated all that stuff, and it comes back really quickly. So, you know, one of the things that concerns me is when we hear that these royalties are going to come back over 20, 30, or more years. The reality is that 75% of what a well is going to produce, it's going to produce in its first year. So yes, those royalty checks are whopping initially, but they dissipate to almost nothing by the third or fifth year. Okay, so these are, this is the science. These are decline curves. As you'll notice, they're in months, they're not in years. So if you don't frack, you don't get the gas. If you, once you frack, it comes back very quickly. Now if you're investing, that's great because you get your investment back very quickly. But the point is these things are not sustainable. What it also realizes or facilitates is the fact that if you want to produce a certain amount of gas as a company, you have to drill, 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 which has been uh, on the side here. This is permit data that we've collected from the DTP. But the point is, is A, what that shows you is that, yes, we've had drilling in this state for years, okay? But it's been mostly conventional. It was only in 2004 that things began to shift. Okay, to the point where by 2010, 2011, that more wells were unconventional than conventional. And of course, that comes with a lot of different things. And again, while this is a, a map of Washington County, it happens very quickly. This development is very fast. So, there were, before 2005, there were zero wells in Washington County. By 2010, there were over 100. By 2014, there were over 200. Okay, so you can see how these things move very quickly. Now, what does that mean? Well, the number of permits that have been uh, done between 2005 and 2013 are over 15,000, and there have been over 7,000, 75, almost 7,500 uh, unconventional wells, and I'll reiterate that, unconventional wells uh, drilled. Each typical well pad needs four to six acres, and that's because they have all these trucks that they need to put in the space. The typical amount of drill cuttings is 1,000 tons. And half of that is actually that of the deposit itself. And that's the beauty of the horizontal drilling, because you can drill down and then go sideways. The importance there, if you have things like chloride, bromide, or other chemicals, arsenic, uh, and also a big thing is the norms of the naturally occurring radioactive materials, you're getting that mostly from your formation, and that's what you need to deal with as far as the waste. Um, the typical amount of water per stimulation is three to five million gallons, okay? The typical amount of protein, uh, propane or sand is three million pounds. So all this stuff is going down the hole. The typical amount of water in an impoundment in the 10 acres is about 15 million gallons, and the amount of chemicals in the frac fluid, if you back calculate the five million gallons at 0.5%, it's about 500,000 gallons. Why is it that 0.5? I did the math myself. 0.5 times one million. So if you've got five million, you've got five times as much as that. The average Marcellus well will produce 42 um, uh, million cubic feet per day. Average total recovery is over 4 billion cubic feet of natural gas. That's a significant amount of natural gas. But on the other side, it's the wells that keep on giving. The gas is gone in a few years. The water is not and continues to come up the hole. And the longer those fluids stay in the hole, the saltier they get. 
So that's one of the things that I've been dealing with. Number one, the produced water that comes out of the hole is hazard placketed, for those of you who know what hazard placketed are, that it's toxic and it's flammable. Um, uh, but the way that the regulations are concerned, once it gets into the uh, truck, it's now called residual waste. Okay. Now, one of the things that my, I've personally been able to do is monitor the, uh, or measure the air quality around some of these condensate tanks. These condensate tanks, you find them in every well pad. Okay, they don't go away. And it turns out, as the fluids come back up the hole, they bring up the organics along with the salts from the, the fluids that you put down the hole. And so this is just some of the examples, some of the things that I've been able to detect that come off these uh, condensate tanks. The point is, when the condensate tanks fill up, there's a pressure valve on top of them. And so as the pressure builds up, they degas. Okay, and what's in that gas? Things like dichlorofluoromethane, chloromethane, n-butane, and hexane, and heptane, polyamine, and xylene. In addition, perhaps sometimes in, in, in some of the tests I've done, benzene, chloroform, cyclohexane, methyl acetone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the point is, is that these condensate tanks are a continuous source of volatile organics. Okay. This is an example, although if we were able to dim the light, you'd see it a little better. Uh, just point to that first. This is a series of what we call flow back and produced water that I've been able to, to uh, obtain. And essentially, each one of these containers has a sample based on 5,000 barrels. So the first 5,000 barrels looks a lot like the stuff that they put down the hole. But by 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, et cetera, in this particular case, I've got you know, 24 samples, so that's 24 times 5,000 barrels. Anyway, you can see now that it's very different from what you put down the hole to what's coming up the hole. And this is almost crude oil here. Now, I can't tell you what, where the well is, okay, or the company, because honestly, I don't know. It's part of the confidentiality of the stuff. Nevertheless, I would say, by the nature of the produced water, it's southwestern Pennsylvania, because we have mixed gas and, and uh, uh, organics, liquids, okay? So this is some of the data that we got from my lab showing that you know, things like sodium and strontium and chloride, very little concentration to begin with, but after just 5,000, 10,000 barrels, we're already up for strontium 200 milligrams per liter. Uh, further down, the, 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 as long, the longer that stuff stays down the hole, the more it sucks up the stuff from the rock, and when it comes back up, it becomes saltier and saltier. So chloride, that's 80 grams per liter of chloride, okay? Uh, strontium, we're at 400 milligrams. Boron, lithium, at 30 milligrams per liter. You can make batteries, maybe. But the point is, is that these are the fluids that come back up and will come back up over time and be stored in those tanks. So those tanks have the, the water, the, the produced water, as well as the volatiles and those will be gas. Um, the other thing is I've been dealing with or investigating uh, water contamination in communities. And this is an example of a community up in Butler. They are currently, now in 2009, there were no wells, or maybe there were a couple of wells, I should say that. But by 2012, we're now talking about 15 pads and 65 laterals. Each one of those lateral wells was fracked with upwards of three to four million gallons of, of fluids and uh, three million gallons of, of three million pounds of propane. So if you add that all up within a two and a half mile radius of this uh, community, uh, they've been you know there's a lot of over 300 million gallons of fluids. And uh, we've done a survey, and we've surveyed 143 households about, out of about 190. Um, we have analyzed the well water from 33 of those households, 56 of uh, the responses to any changes of water quality since the drilling. 25 homes have manganese levels above the secondary uh, contaminant levels. Only two homes have coliforms, which is a good thing, which means that they're not affected by septic. But their contaminations include things like bromide, chloride, barium, strontium, and there are different, you know, different wells have been contaminated with different stuff. Why is that? Because we, we know of those households, the well depths vary between 62 feet to one, in one case, 900 feet. 
So you can't draw a conclusion saying, okay, you say, you know, did, did a gas company you know, um, cause the contamination? Well, some of it looks like it, others doesn't. But the point is, is that through the stimulation of all those fluids and all that activity has caused things to happen to the water quality of that community, and that's without a doubt. The problem is, or where the dynamics are now, None of them have leases. None of them have impact fees. None of them have compensation for their bad water. 30 families are now dependent upon a volunteer water drive to provide them with drinking water. Okay? So the thing is, is that they, you know, the drilling is going on elsewhere, but the community impacts are there in that community. So we're moving down, and, and we just got started here. You know, people talk about Cross Creek County Park. Uh, these are some of the examples of uh, an area we've been uh, working in in Bray. Um, we've already tested eight wells, and four out of those eight wells had detectable methane, and three of those had mixed hydrocarbons. The worst affected had over three milligrams per liter of methane, but also had mixed hydrocarbons, which indicates to us that this is you know, from a gas well, whether it's Marcellus or whether it's a shallower we don't know at this point, but we need to study more. But the point is, is that the well water, according to the community, their well water has changed. Okay, and we're going to, and, and I'll point this out. These are all the well pads that have gone in over the last few years around, and this is the community right here. So if we focus our attention now on Deer Lakes and what our possible concerns about drilling in deal lakes and what the council should be concerned about is, is that number one, so this is an example of Pittsburgh Mills, so if you're looking for an example of what's going to come up out of the hole, what kind of gas, what kind of product, then you know, find out about what's going on at Pittsburgh Mills. That particular one, again, this is the Galleria right here. It's 1,200 feet to the nearest shopping. I, I wasn't able to find out what the store is. <laughs> Macy's? Okay, so it's 1,200 feet from Macy's. There's six, there's five wells here and one well here. What's puzzling me is there's only six condensate tanks. Typically, you need two condensate tanks per well. That seems to be the average to handle all the fluids that are coming back up. But you can count the number of separators. There's one separator per well. There's six of them right there. Uh, oh, by the way, this is... Not to be flippant, but uh, a colleague of mine said, well, this is dinner by candlelight. This is while they were flaring, and that's the Eaton Park. Uh, I've seen that. Okay, now, getting to Deer Lakes, the last thing I want to talk about, and uh, hopefully I didn't go too fast, too slow, whatever, we're, we're going on time. Uh, when I heard about you know, drilling in the parks and understanding the kind of impacts that I've seen in well water, a lot of times... It's not brines from the drilling. A lot of times it's not stuff that you might associate. I like to say I haven't found a smoking gun, right? I haven't detected personally, um, say, drilling components or, you know, frac fluids, what they put in, like the chemicals or whatever, in any of the samples I've sampled. Because usually I'm there several months after the fact. Okay, I'm not there when they're drilling and fracking. But what I am finding is evidence of legacy issues that they've kind of shooken up things such that we have mines, we have abandoned oil and gas wells. There's three of those within the woodlands themselves. Oops, I said the word. Anyway, the community in Butler. Um, so the first thing I did when I heard about this and then uh, was communicating with uh, uh, Councilwoman Means, I went, and this is from our own DEP. These are maps of undermining in the two townships where Deer Lakes Park resides. And so the point is, anywhere where it's gray is where there are mines. Now, the, the resolution, I don't know how good that is, but my point is, is that if you drill anywhere <coughs> in these areas, you are going to have to deal with abandoned mines. You're going to have to deal with mine drainage. You're going to have to deal with those fluids. And the potential for contamination, not from the fracking fluids, but rather from pre-existing contamination and uh, pre-existing uh, lake species. So, again, there's other things that we've been working on. I'm hoping, are they, are they going to use open impoundments to, to recycle? Yeah. Okay, good. Because I've been working on the microbiology of the recycling pits and 
one of the things we found that they're, they're marine and high salt strains. They're very different than what you find in our streams. But anyway, um, so again, I hope to provide some information to council, some things to think about, and uh, I'll take questions. Mr. Robinson? Thank you. I thank you, Madam Chair, for being uh, bold and courageous to arrange this meeting, hearing however people want to characterize it. And I thank my colleagues who are willing to come and hear. Uh, I have been educated over the last few months on this subject as a member of council. But as I stated before, I'm concerned primarily how this affects black people. Since I haven't heard from any black people on this, I have to ask you the question, sir, are there any black people at Duquesne University, like yourself, that have the same expertise, if you're aware of that. And I, I would say, no, they're not. We have students that are now aware because they've taken my classes, okay? And then I would also like to address your question, that it is people with modest means that are often suffering some of the worst consequences of, you know, people are getting rich, so to speak, but, you know, whether it's someone who lives in an apartment or a rental place that has, you know, well water, but do, don't own their mineral rights, may not even own their surface rights, or could own their surface rights, but because they don't own their mineral rights, they've lost that ability. Are there any households that you have surveyed, or any areas where you have surveyed, where people who look like myself have been involved? Has any of your research specifically related to people who look like me, black people, African Americans, colored people, Negroes, whatever you want to call them. Yes, and at least in one case, that individual now has drinking water provided by a volunteer effort, and that's in gray. Okay, so yes, a family of African Americans that two homes have problems, and one of them has been helped through volunteer work. One last question from Mike, and I thank you, Madam Chair, for your indulgence. Uh, I think it's important that we not miss the opportunity to specifically indicate the people who are probably most adversely affected. I have not heard from one African American leader, not one colored leader, not one Negro leader, who has said this is a good idea or a bad idea. I haven't heard from anybody directly. But I know, being an African American, people are concerned. If they're not concerned today, they'll be concerned tomorrow. For some, this is not a black issue. For me, it's an issue that obviously impacts everybody. That means it impacts black people. So I will continue to try and find somewhere in the United States of America a black person like me. And if you know someone, sir, I'd appreciate you telling me so I can at least talk to them, an expert, to get their perspective, hopefully, before I have to vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Means. I guess my question would be, you mentioned about all the pre-existing mines underneath a lot of the property, and you're saying there's a lot of pre-existing mines around Deer Lakes. Right. And, and you said you don't seem to be as concerned about the water that they're going to use to frack, because now they're developing ways to you know, take that away, recycle. You're not happy about that, it doesn't sound like. Right. But you're more concerned about what would happen with these pre-existing mines, and what is the water in those mines? They're, it's so contaminated, and then the drilling Let's that water somehow escape somehow, or could you explain that to me? Right, so the, the whole idea is that when they do the, the drilling and the fracking, they're generating a lot of pressures, a lot of changes. Um, it could even, I would say, be aggravated by the seismic, which I understand they're not going to do any seismic, but honestly, if they're not doing seismic, then how do they know where the gas is, or whether, how deep the formation is? and is that if there are pre-existing, if they did seismic, they'd see if there were mines. Um, okay, that's kind of an interesting question. Why do you think they wouldn't do seismic then? Because I think, Barbara, you've asked them a few times, why, why wouldn't they do it if, if, if there's that? Well, I thought they weren't going to 
go on the park property. That's the, you know. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, but, but again, the, the idea is that there's a lot of things. They like to say there's nothing, you know, that because it's like Vegas, what goes on at 5,000 feet doesn't affect the surface. Well, we're finding that's not to be completely yes. accurate. So, you know, if you have pre-existing things between there, and depending on how close they are to where they're actually fracking, because some of these fracks do go out, the fractures go out to 1,000 feet in any particular direction, that they can cause um, movement of other fluids uh, and gases above. So why, you know, because when we have range here, they can't, they did give us, and, and I'm not, you know, range is a great company, I'm not saying anything against range, they gave us a little bit of sand and said, you know, this is the sand and there aren't any really dangerous chemicals here that we're dealing with, and, you know, I have to take them at their word, but what's in the minds with your expertise that we should be concerned about that if there is something going on underneath ground could come up. Right. Well, like what, well basically what happens is if you're going to get high concentrations of iron, high concentrations of manganese, sulfate. So, but interestingly enough, those are what we call secondary standard water quality issues. So taste and smell. But basically what it comes down to is that the water is no longer potable because you've got to get rid of that stuff. You're not going to be taking a shower with red water. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Um, Barbara? Well, I was going to say, Jan, good question, because that's, I was going to go down the same path. Um, and I've been out to Deer Lakes, and, and I know the various people that we've spoken to have said that whole area is undermined, and coal mine, and not that far down. Right. So... That, that is an issue. Um, I don't have a question so much as a comment sort of uh, feeding off what Mr. Robinson was talking about. We've had people come before uh, county council and it seems like almost everyone who has come has a vested interest in financial interests, either a job or a property, you know, and um, you know, the people, the Gulicks, the farmers, don't live there. You know, they rent their farm out, so they won't receive the impacts. They live in Westmoreland County. Another person came and talked about how this is their third generation family farm. And then I looked at the list, and he lives in Bethel Park. Well, how, how do you do that? But, you know, so again, in essence, it's an investment property. And... You know, we're not hearing from the rank and file people in in those communities that are not going to directly benefit financially or otherwise, since we've been told there are zero new jobs um, because of this drilling. So, you know, that's just sort of a piggyback on what you were saying. And I don't know if I have any questions for you directly. Thank you. Why the time? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, so, so could I just say I'm going to have to leave, but I do thank everybody for coming. I told you ahead of time I don't feel yeah, safe. So yeah. thank you very much for holding this meeting. Um, so, Professor, so when you say salt water, you're not talking about um, sodium chloride. You're talking about, you know, because it was very disturbing to me to have the range resources people describe the, the backflow water, the water that came up as, it's just salt water. And it, it's not just sodium chloride, is it? No, no, there's strontium, there's barium, there's bromide. Again, the issue with the bromide is, is that it was getting into our streams that were being used, or rivers that were being used for our drinking water, and bromide mixes with the organics and chlorine in the chlorination step making trihalomethanes, so that's a problem. Um, okay, why is trihalomethanes? Trihalomethanes, <laughs> they're chloroform and bromoform. There are two substances that are highly regulated by the EPA that if you're a publicly, if you're, if you're a public water drinking, you know, company, you can't have that stuff in your drinking water. 
So, uh, but I mean, more to your point, it's a complex mix of organics and inorganics, um, and the concentrations are not seawater. Okay, so I'm just trying to remember offhand, it would be 3.4 grams per liter for seawater. It's 80 grams per liter coming out of this stuff. So the concentrations are way higher, and even things like reverse osmosis and other treatments that are typically used for drinking water can't apply because it's just too concentrated. Um, does anybody else have questions? Because uh, James, you want to ask another question? Well, okay, the other I, thing is, I can be around too. That if you want afterwards, or okay. if you want to, uh, oh, okay. Well, I just, um, I, I just talked to you and I told you that. Um, you know, it, it's dry gas. They're telling us what's going to come out of the growth farm under Deer Lakes is dry black gas. And um, they told us it's going to go straight to market. And I wanted you to comment on that. Well, I'm just, again, I, I'm, I, I would question that only because we're in southwest Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, there is this demarcation of anything. You know, east of 79 is dry. Anything west is wet. But, you know, you don't know until you drill the hole. So it may be that you'll hear, well, wait a minute, we, we, well, we have to put in this separator plant, we have to put in this hydrator. All I know is like even in Butler County, they just put in two different facilities, one in Renfrew and one in, uh, I think it's Conoconessing, they're tripling it in size because they're getting liquids just in Butler. So. But isn't the Pittsburgh Mills, is that a place where there's dry gas or not? I, I don't know. You don't know. Okay. Um, the other thing, that was like a comment, but I would like to see seismic testing at the park. I'm very uncomfortable that they say they've done it all around the park, but they haven't done it over the, it's like about two square miles, because they don't really know what's under there. I mean, there could be abandoned mines from a hundred years, not mines, uh, not just coal mines, but there could be an oil or gas well that's a hundred years old that somebody plucked up that's there as well. Right. And um, could you comment on, I know of, and a lot of these, um, well, uh, do you think they're not going to flare? That's one of the things that you think that's well, usually, I mean, my understanding of why they flare is to control the pressure initially because these things, they, they pump fluids down at 10 to, well, 10 to 12,000 PSI mm -hmm. and it comes back up. And so, you know, uh, they burn it off initially just to get control of, of uh, the pressures. And then once they can, you know, uh, do that, then they, they, they stop flaring. But, you know, to my knowledge, most of the wells around here have and they flared the one in Pittsburgh Mills. So if you want to use that as an example, you know, they flared out those. And, and could you just talk for a minute about what gas has come off a condensation tank? Um, could you, I know you touched on a little bit, but could you... Right, well, well the idea is that these, these mixed hydrocarbons that are part of the, the shale formation, again, the, the exact composition coming up the hole will differ from place to place, but it's clear that these, you know, the condensate tanks, the way they're designed, uh, will have volatile organics uh, that, you know, things like, as I said, this, um, the, the hexanes and, and xylenes and things like that. But, you know, I'm not a chemist. So okay. Could you, I, I, I think from our earlier conversation, you said the things that are coming out are the things that were in hairspray that are you know, oh, well, aerosol cans. Yeah, one of the, no one of the things that we saw are coming up with uh, um, chlorofluorocarbons. And that, to me, is a, I'm, I'm perplexed about that because those are illegal and they're supposed to be man-made, but we've detected them, at least in those uh, series of, of uh, constant tanks that we monitor. And those constant tanks are outgassing. Yeah. So that, that those hydrocarbons are escaping from the condensate. Right. So when they come and they empty it, they're not hauling that away. That's already left. With right. That's already left. That's already left. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.